Aurelian had restored Rome, but his untimely demise, followed by Tacitus's brief rule, left the empire teetering on the edge of disintegration once again. The empire desperately needed a leader with the prowess of Aurelian to uphold his legacy and sustain the momentum he had set in motion. That leader was Probus, one of Aurelian's trusted generals. Our ancient sources claim that Probus matched Aurelian in martial prowess, but surpassed him in virtue due to his gracious nature. Zosimus praised him as both distinguished and equitable. The Road to Power Marcus Aurelius Aquitius Probus, born on the 19th of August, circa 232 AD in Sirmium, Lower Pannonia. Details about his family background remain sparse. While some believe his father was a farmer, others speculate he might have been a military officer. The Historia Augusta, a source often viewed with skepticism, sheds light on Probus' early career. It highlights his valor as a tribune, crossing the Danube during the Saramatian War and subsequently receiving accolades for his efforts. According to this document, the Emperor Valerian recognized Probus's potential early on, nominating him as the inaugural commander of the Legio III, the Fortunate Legion, a title that is somewhat enigmatic since no records of such a legion exist. Gallienus later entrusted Probus with the leadership of the Balkan armies. Under Aurelian's reign, Probus's responsibilities expanded as he took command of the 10th Legion. It's worth noting that separate accounts affirm Aurelian's favoritism towards Probus, presumably assigning him the crucial naval task of retaking Egypt during the Palmyrene War. Following this, he was dispatched to the Rhine region once the Gallic Empire had been reintegrated into the Roman Empire. Historical anecdotes even suggest Probus played a part in tempering some of Aurelian's more ruthless tendencies. In a subsequent turn of events, it was Tacitus who granted Probus the esteemed position of overseeing the entire Eastern Command. Upon Tacitus's sudden demise, speculation undoubtedly buzzed among the soldiers about the next potential leader. An officer advocating for Probus exclaimed, We need an emperor who embodies strength, fairness, humility, compassion and integrity. The Latin term for moral integrity is probus. Recognizing this coincidence, the soldiers saw it as a sign echoing in unison, probus is the one. Seizing the moment, the general accepted their support, donning the symbolic purple. He professed to be Tacitus's rightful heir, challenging Florian's claim. The veracity of his statement, however, remains uncertain. Following the demise of Tacitus, his half-brother Florian ascended to the role of emperor. However, his reign was short-lived. By 276 AD, Probus, leading legions in the Eastern territories, was hailed as emperor by his soldiers, putting him in direct conflict with Florianus. The forces of the two competing emperors met in Cilicia, where Probus's superior army size and his esteemed reputation as a military tactician tilted the scales in his favor. Realizing the inevitability of their defeat, Florianus's own soldiers turned on him, resulting in his assassination. Once Florian was out of the picture, the Senate willingly recognized Probus as the new emperor in the latter part of 276. Probus, being astute, made a point to consistently display, at minimum, a token of reverence to the Senate, a strategy that not only solidified his position, but also won him the admiration of subsequent Latin scholars. He commenced his first consulship in 277, adhering to tradition. As narrated in the Historia Augusta, Probus is said to have avenged Aurelian's death by luring his surviving assassins to a feast, only to subsequently signal his guards to ambush and eliminate them, a scenario reminiscent of the infamous Red Wedding from Game of Thrones. The veracity of this account is questionable. However, if accurate, it indicates the conspiracy against Aurelian was either intricately planned or that Aurelian's list of enemies was quite extensive. It's curious that attendees at the banquet did not recognize each other, which might have alerted them to the impending doom. The same account indicates that Probus avenged the deaths of both Aurelian and Tacitus by tracking down their assassins and executing them, yet showed leniency to those who once supported Florian. Zonaris verifies Probus's actions, emphasizing his retaliation against the culprits. It can be inferred that Probus sought to firmly deter any attempts on the lives of reigning emperors. On the throne. It is probable that Probus took it upon himself to address the remaining barbarians in Asia Minor, 
following the interventions of Tacitus and Florian. By 277 AD, he was honored with the title Gothicus Maximus. With the entirety of the empire under his control, Probus promptly assembled a massive army to confront the Franks and Alemanni in Gaul. Tacitus had previously left these threats unchecked due to engagements in Asia Minor. Gaul had suffered greatly, still in disarray with roaming barbarian groups pillaging at will and having taken over numerous towns. Many possibly yearned for the leadership of Posthumus and his successors from the Gallic Empire. Even though these raiders began to retreat with their spoils, Probus dispatched his generals and legions to chase them down. The barbarian onslaught left the land so ravaged that food became scarce for everyone, be it local residents, invaders, or the Roman legions. Yet in this grim backdrop, a miracle occurred for Probus. A sudden gust brought forth both rain and grain. The grain, once baked, yielded edible loaves. The Roman forces managed to fend off a recent wave of Frankish attacks, subsequently capturing the leader of the Lugi tribe along with his son after a year-long campaign. Once the Franks released their captives and surrendered their loot, they were allowed to leave unharmed. Probus took the reins of the legions that defeated the Alemanni and instituted a reward system in Gaul. An aureus, a gold coin, for each barbarian head presented. In the meantime, other Germanic tribes, specifically the Burgundians and Vandals, rushed to Raetia in droves, outnumbering Probus's troops to assist the Franks. The emperor, displaying strategic prowess, cornered the barbarians at a riverbank. Using tactical provocations, the Romans lured small barbarian groups to cross the river, systematically annihilating each group. A significant portion of the barbarian forces eventually sought peace, proposing to hand over their loot in exchange for their captive comrades held by the Romans. Yet, when these tribes failed to return Roman prisoners, an infuriated Probus retaliated. In a fierce confrontation, he subdued nine tribal leaders, integrating 16,000 Germanic warriors into the Roman military. These new additions were stationed far from the Rhine borders. Reflecting on this, Probus remarked, the Roman prefers to have barbarian allies in action rather than just in sight. Probus successfully reclaimed the entirety of the Rhine and upper Danube regions, earning him the distinguished title of Germanicus Maximus. Under his leadership, the Franks were driven out of northern Gaul, the Alamanni from central Gaul, and the Burgundians and Vandals from both Raetia and the Balkans. His significant military triumphs led to the fortification of regions east of the Rhine, likely establishing a defense line against potential barbarian invasions. The Eastern Campaign. Aurelian's dealings with Persia remained unresolved at the time of his passing. While it's not entirely evident that Aurelian intended to launch a campaign against the Sassanids, the presence of both Probus and Tacitus in the East at his death hints at preparations for a significant offensive. However, after ascending to the throne, Probus might have deferred a Persian invasion due to his tenuous position and the pressing barbarian invasions in Gaul. By 279, circumstances had changed, and Probus deemed it apt to venture east. Adding complexity to the situation was the emergence of a usurper. This period's instability can be encapsulated by the tale of Saturninus, a Moor, and once an ally of Probus. Serving as the Syrian governor and wielding influence in Egypt, Saturninus was declared emperor in Antioch, around 278, following disturbances in the crucial grain-producing region. His declaration as emperor also found support in Egypt. Realizing the impending risks, Saturninus accepted the imperial title, surmising that his fate was in jeopardy regardless of his choice. But as Probus, backed by his formidable forces, advanced, the insurrectionists recognized their error. In a twist of fate, they executed the very leader they had proclaimed. A significant issue arose when a group of bandits established themselves in a mountain stronghold known as Kremna, situated to the north of Lycia, in the Asoria region of southern Asia Minor. Zosimus provides a comprehensive account of these events. As Probus advanced, Lydius, the bandit chieftain responsible for terrorizing the provinces of Pamphylia and Lycia, took refuge in Kremna. Faced with a Roman siege, Lydius resorted to demolishing buildings within the fortified town to cultivate crops for sustenance. However, with an overwhelming population to feed, he expelled those he deemed non-essential. In a tactical move, the Romans redirected them back into Kremna. In an effort to secure food, Lydius dug a tunnel, which the Romans soon discovered and sealed. 
In a desperate bid to conserve provisions, Lydius ordered the execution of anyone he considered expendable. This decision wasn't well received, leading one of his top archers to defect to the Romans. Leveraging his knowledge of Lydius's habits, the defector collaborated with the Romans, employing their long-range arrow launcher, the Scorpion, to assassinate Lydius. With their leader's dying words urging them not to yield, the remaining bandits still surrendered soon after. With this, Isoria was liberated from one of its gravest threats. As a safeguard, Probus established a colony of his veterans in the region. The Historia Augusta affirms Zosimus's narrative, highlighting Probus's encounter with an Isaurian bandit chieftain. Probus continued his eastward march towards Syria. Meanwhile, southern Egypt faced an invasion by the Blemis tribes, and Ptolemaeus on the Nile experienced unrest. Fortunately, the regional governor managed to quell these disturbances. By the time Probus reached the area, Saturninus had already met his end. The accounts differ on the specifics. The Historia Augusta claims Probus got wind of Saturninus's situation and dispatched men to assassinate him, while Zosimus states that Saturninus was killed by his own men before Probus could address the threat. With these challenges encountered during his journey, Probus's resolve for a confrontation with the formidable Persian Empire seemed to wane. The Persians, however, were dealing with their own internal chaos. Following Shapur's death, several civil wars ensued until Bahram II ascended the throne. As a new ruler, Bahram sought to stabilize his reign and was open to a peace treaty that favored Rome. Subsequently, a truce was forged and commemorative coins branded with Persicus Maximus were minted during this period, symbolizing Probus's triumph. The emperor then made haste to return to Europe, no doubt fearing what he might find there. Uprising in Gaul Probus returned to find his fears confirmed. In his absence, two uprisings had erupted. Bonosus, formerly in charge of the Roman fleet on the Rhine, had been dismissed by Probus after a blunder that resulted in barbarians torching his boats. Seizing an opportunity, Bonosus declared himself emperor in 280 AD, coinciding with Probus's campaign in the east. In the same time frame, Proculus was declared the leader at Colonia Agrippinensis. He seemed to have ambitions of creating an independent Gallic empire, encompassing Britain, Gaul, and Spain. Additionally, the British governor had risen in revolt. Circumstances in Gaul might have deteriorated further after Probus's departure. The combination of a devastated economy, frequent barbarian raids, and an overall decline in law enforcement possibly drove the citizens and the military to seek localized solutions. The Historia Augusta even credits Proculus with warding off a new wave of attacks from the Alemanni. As Probus and his forces journeyed through Thrace, they settled around a hundred thousand Basturni tribespeople, allies of Rome, possibly escaping external barbarian threats along the Roman frontier near the Danube's mouth or within Thrace. Several Franks were also settled. However, upon Probus's departure, these Franks began constructing ships, initiating raids on the shores of Greece, Sicily and North Africa, and then returning with minimal losses. Much like the pretender Saturninus, support for both rebel usurpers waned as Probus approached. One rebel leader met his end through treachery, the other took his own life, resulting in only minor clashes with Probus's legions. The uprising in Britain was suppressed by a Probus general, who had been previously recommended by the rebels for the same position, and was eager to make restitution. By the end of 281, Probus celebrated a grand triumph in Rome, renowned for the diversity of subjugated tribes presented. The festivities peaked with an elaborate beast hunt within a faux forest set up in the Circus Maximus, where attendees could dive in and claim animals like ostriches, stags, boars, deer and sheep. 300 gladiators, sourced from barbarian captives, engaged in a lethal combat. Around this period, 80 gladiators planned and executed an escape, killing their overseers. As they embarked on a spree of thefts, other escapees joined them, only to be later apprehended by pursuing soldiers. Probus had shown himself to be as accomplished and dynamic as his predecessor, Aurelian, yet economic instability persisted everywhere. An indication of the era's challenges was evident when Athens, in 280, rebuilt its walls on a smaller scale using debris from the older, more expansive wall, 
which the Gothic incursion between 267 to 268 AD had devastated. Indeed, archaeological findings suggest that during Probus's reign, many of the walls encircling Roman towns were constructed, likely under his guidance. The immense wall around Rome, initiated by Aurelian, also reached completion during this time. Although Probus had the advantage of relative peace, he couldn't make significant strides in economic reforms like his renowned predecessor Aurelian. This was primarily because he hadn't acquired substantial wealth. Most of his conquests involved barbarians who didn't possess considerable treasures. Any gold he did amass was largely expended on his lavish triumph. Probus persisted in minting coins similar to Aurelian's distorted coinage, and his coins indicate his devotion to the sun god, Saul Invictus, much like Aurelian. To significantly boost the imperial coffers, Probus realized he'd need to triumph over the Persians. A hint of the emperor's insecurities might be gleaned from the numerous consulships he assumed for himself. During the six consecutive years from 277 to 282, he held the consul position five times. Additionally, Probus took steps to promote viticulture by relaxing certain protective regulations over 180 years old, established during Emperor Domitian's reign. These rules had restricted the cultivation of vineyards outside Italy. Before Probus, Aurelian had initiated similar reforms within Italy. The outcome of these changes led to increased prosperity in regions suitable for grape cultivation. In 282 AD, Probus began gathering forces for a campaign against Persia, possibly driven by the aim to plunder and bolster the dwindling economy. But his armies resisted. The exact cause of these uprisings within the military in 282 remains somewhat ambiguous. Contemporary scholars speculate that the core issue might have been the prolonged, relentless service required of the troops. Given that a typical military tenure spanned 20 years, many soldiers might have been consistently engaged in combat during both Aurelian's and Probus's reigns. They faced endless waves of barbarians, undertook the monumental task of empire restoration, and teetered on the brink of multiple intense civil conflicts. Additionally, widespread deaths due to persistent plagues and barbarian invasions likely dwindled potential new enlistments, compelling existing soldiers to extend their service durations. However, Latin historians offer a contrasting perspective. They describe Probus as a strict disciplinarian who believed in keeping soldiers constantly engaged, fearing that idleness might spark rebellious thoughts. He tasked one of his armies with a vast land reclamation project near his birthplace, Sirmium, in Pannonia. This endeavor, devoid of the rewards and spoils typically associated with victorious battles, was met with disdain by the troops. It was also an odd assignment, especially if the army was gearing up for a Persian confrontation. In a pivotal speech, Probus expressed his hope for a future where soldiers might no longer be necessary. This statement proved to be the tipping point. The Raetia-based army rose in revolt, proclaiming their commander Carus as the new emperor around August 282 AD. As Probus dispatched a unit to quell this uprising, they defected to support Carus instead. Not long after, the soldiers engaged in the land reclamation task revolted, cornering Probus inside a substantial watchtower. They eventually stormed the structure, ending Probus's life in September of 282 AD. Such was the demise of one of Rome's most esteemed generals and an exemplary emperor. While the precise date of his death remains mostly undisputed, a recently uncovered papyrus hints at an eighth year of reign. The traditional timeline places his leadership from 276 to 282, spanning seven years. This supposed eighth year might be attributed to a mere clerical oversight by the document's author. Final Thoughts Subsequent Roman chroniclers never shied away from lauding Probus's reign, painting it with panegyrical strokes. Yet even contemporary researchers recognize that, while Aurelian might have been the force to rejuvenate the empire, it was Probus who fortified it against barbarian threats. Victor likened him to a second Hannibal. Eutropius extolled him as a fervent, diligent and just leader, matching Aurelian in martial prowess, but surpassing him in virtue due to his gracious nature. Zosimus praised him as both distinguished and equitable. Probus stands as one of the unsung heroes of ancient Rome. After Aurelian's efforts to restore Rome, Probus took up the mantle and proved instrumental in solidifying the empire's resurgence. An outstanding general, he expertly repelled numerous barbarian invasions. 
But while his military genius is undisputed, Probus's administrative choices, especially his decision to put the army to menial tasks, became his downfall. Sadly, for all his achievements, his end was undignified, killed by his own troops, frustrated by his rigorous demands. In a tumultuous period for Rome, Probus was a beacon of stability and strength, even if his reign was cut tragically short. Thank you for watching the video. Remember to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we make here on the channel. See you in the next video in this series, which will be on Carus.